Hi, everybody. Welcome to our new episode. We're going to be exploring attachment tonight um, and how what how much we're attached to things in our life and what that robs us from being having access to. So we want to explore this whole thing of attachment because what you realize is the more attached you are, you'll start to see the degree of unwillingness rise. So we'll play with that a little bit. Welcome, Betty. Hi. So anything you want to say to set up for the conversation? Well, yeah. I, I, attachment is very much a human experience. It's looking at the picture 24-7 that's right in front of you. All the seeing, all the hearing, all the feeling, all the touching, all the tasting, all that stuff in our human experience, some of which we enjoy to the degree that we really become attached to it. We aren't happy when it's not present. We entertain it by preference. And to the degree that you get hooked into that, you got to realize that you're living in the past because the seen, heard, and felt is feedback, means something's already happened. And now you're getting feedback on where you've been standing even a minute ago and what you've really liked then. And you're completely closed off to the possibility of right now and what next. Right. So I want to let you all know that we're sponsored by the Institute of Metaphysical Science. You can check out our website at HTTPS scientific metaphysics.org. It has schedules and materials and all of that that you might find useful in your exploration. So do that. And we're going to continue and we'll dive right in. So in mind is the athlete, you say the phenomena seen, heard and felt has no meaning in and of itself. Human forms of resistance give it meaning and have it persist. So yeah. human forms of resistance, give me some of those. Human forms of resistance are, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to improve it. I'm going to rearrange it. I'm going to organize it. I love it. It's what I want to have around me all the time. I want to do it that way and no other way. I want to have those people present and no one else. You're not open to what's possible. Okay, so human forms of resistance are all those things that uh, Betty just mentioned. And that's what gives it meaning. So you have something happen and instantly we know, hey, that's what it means, right? It was good, it was bad, whatever. We have our story about it. All of that stuff, would you say, Betty, are forms of resistance? Yep. Okay. And they have it persist in your experience of living. Okay. Okay. You are giving it resistance. You, the one in giving it resistance is the one that has the experience of being limited. Okay. Very good. So if you have any questions or comments or anything like that, please feel free to put them in the comment box and we can, you know, the comments and we'll see them and we can include them. So any questions or comments, that's what we would recommend. And uh, we'll just continue in the conversation. So on Mind is the Athlete, page 87, you wrote, the challenge arises to be sufficiently disciplined to ongoingly release any meaning you're attaching to the identity language. So the challenge is to be disciplined enough to release any meaning or any attachment that you have about what's showing up. Yep. Right? Yep. And when you can release, when you can do that, then you're left wide open to whatever comes next. You're not holding it in place. Yeah. And, and what I want to mention is you really don't have to hunt for where you have attachment. All you have to do is recognize, uh-oh, here's a problem. Because the freedom from that problem is letting go of the attachment right. that you're holding. Yeah. It reminds me of the, it reminds me of the, um, the story about, this guy, so he falls off a cliff and he reaches out and he grabs onto this branch that's hanging down. So he's hanging from the branch and he's pleading to God, God, please save me. Please don't let me fall to my death. I will do anything. Just tell me what I should do. I'm yours. So this big voice opens up and it says, let go. 
And the guy's hanging on and he looks down and he's hanging on and he looks up and he said, is there anyone else up there? <laughs> yep. Like and that's it. what we do when somebody said, you know, when we're looking at releasing our attachment, it's not like, oh, I'm attached. Okay, I'll let it go. And, and that's also, when you think about it, that's also where we have a picture of what's next. Mm -hmm. And that's also based in the past when I'm living with attachment. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want what's next. So I don't want to let go. Right. Or you have expectations and then right. it doesn't fit your expectations. So that gets, that doesn't happen. So now you're like, oh my God, that's, it's all wrong. It shouldn't have gone this way. And you're out to do something to manipulate it, to get it more in liking to what you had conceived of. Right. Right. And all of those things are forms of attachment. So it's like you can say, you know, yep, I'm, I get all this perfection functioning. It's all the same thing going on. And then we argue in our life for the thing we are attached to. Yeah. We justify it. And it's the same thing as saying, let go. And us saying, is there anyone else up there? <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Again, on page 87, you say language lacks the capacity to produce fulfillment. So yeah, you can't get fulfillment out of the past. Well, yeah, out of all the stuff you're looking at. Yeah. Fulfillment doesn't live out there. That's right. So anytime. It lives in who you're being consciously. Yeah, aware. exactly. Right. So it wouldn't be that fulfillment ever comes from out there or what you can see here feel taste and touch right and sometimes it feels like it does uh -huh. and for a period of time it may well feel rewarding uh -huh. but there will come a moment when you'll recognize that it's empty stuff right because it's not where you are as being it's where you were in belief yeah and so that's when there is to let go yeah so when we talk about when we talk about letting go, say a bit more about that. Like it's not necessarily an easy process, particularly when you're invested. Well, it depends, what, on, depends on how you're viewing it. Yeah. You know, a really simple, simple, oversimplified example. Uh, you know, if, if I'm a kid and I'm learning arithmetic and I say two and two is five. And then the teacher comes along and gives me a few exercises in which I discover that in fact, two and two is four. Right. So I say, oh, okay. And so I try it out and I find out my arithmetic papers are more accurate when I use two and two is four. Yes. That I make better grades at school and so on and so on. So pretty soon I'm pretty sure that two and two is four really works. Yeah. I don't even have to erase two and two is five. It is a non-issue. I just leave it alone. Right. I go on with what's true. And I'm home free. Right. But in, as you grow up and as things happen beyond two and two is four and two and two is not five. So beyond that, you start there to have, beyond that, Kim. I'm just saying <laughs> that beyond that, you then have things happen. So you don't get that job that you were counting on that was perfect for you. And you were so excited and you got along with everyone. They didn't make you the offer. Or you have <clears throat> other stuff that comes up. You might have, you might, you know, have, um, you know, get a condition or whatever. You might have a cold. You might get sick. You might. And all of those things are in the realm of this should not be happening to me. Right? Like. And so, so when you're, when you're attached, what's the process? What's the. You know, how do you see that? Eventually things get bad enough where you're like, okay, I give, I give. And when you do that, you actually let go. Yeah. Um, so, so what's the, what's, talk to me about that letting go, that attachment. Like when you're really married into something and you, I know you've worked with tons of people that call you and they are, what is it that has you just kind of let up like, let go, like, be freer with that. Yeah. What do you know about yourself? What facts do you know? 
Who are you being? Mm -hmm. So if I live and move and have being mentally, mm -hmm. then the seen, heard, and felt that we look at 24-7 as human beings is feedback. Yeah. And learning that is not a simple process uh -huh. because we look at it 24-7. Right. So you want to take the direct and route. And wake up in the morning to this sure. picture again. Yeah. And look Ground in the mirror. And see, yeah. I, you know, I look in the mirror and I see Betty and I think, oh, for heaven's sakes, you know, yeah. still with me. Um, yeah. So the only thing I know is that life, human living, is a process of discovering who you are beyond the thing you see in the mirror. Who is that? Yeah. What is the outstanding quality of the being, being Betty, mm -hmm. calling itself Betty? Mm -hmm. Because there is a divinity, as Shakespeare said, there is a divinity that shapes our ends. What is that divinity? What is that all about? And it's beginning to make a difference in the way I live my daily life when I begin to explore what more is there to Betty beyond the thing I see in the mirror. Yeah. And the more I check into that, the broader becomes my view of who I am. Right. The larger the horizon, the more it begins to all make sense that the seen, heard, and felt stuff is the way it looks to my point of view on the reality present, but then there are qualities about the reality present that I may not be entertaining. And so I have to really take a look. Well, if this is spiritual, what do I know about spiritual? Oh, well, it doesn't have a, a three-dimensional look. It's not anything I can put my hand on. But there are feelings about it. There are, what, what do I want to say there? There are facts that I can identify and I tr really try them out because I don't know until I see the outcome of, of trusting that whether or not it's a fact. Mm -hmm. But if I know that it's intelligent, it's always present, it's powerful, how do I know that? Well, when it takes care of me in the face of really huge odds, like some disease disappears or some broken bone begins to not be painful and take care of itself and begins to mend and so on. Um, pretty soon I begin to see that paying attention to the mental aspect of myself, the stuff I don't see, the stuff I can't touch, mm -hmm. I became, become really aware of the power of that presence that has Betty show up. Mm -hmm. And that awareness, conscious awareness, alters the way I live, Betty. And so I have greater freedom. I have abundance. Mm -hmm. I have fewer problems. And when there's one coming up, it disappears fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, so bit by bit, I begin to recognize that, hey, this is not just a joke. This is making a difference in the way I live my everyday two-legged existence. Right. And, and it shows up in the feedback. There are no longer big problems. There's no longer lack. There's no longer dis discomfort. Mm -hmm. There's no longer an unmet disaster. There's no, yeah. you know, things are lightening up. Right. And I, it makes a difference. Right. And what you're pointing to, that occurs to me that what you're pointing to is curiosity. When you notice. Well, it's, it's satisfying the curiosity. Yeah, but when you notice. It's the inquiry. Right, but when you're looking at your life and there it is, you know, looking not exactly how you might have expected it to look, that you say, huh, now who am I? Yeah. There's a curiosity that would ask that question. That's right. So it, it points to a curiosity about who are you and what is all this about in the first place? And look like, at the qualities of curiosity. Can I put my finger on it? Can I hold it in my hand? Right. Can I give it to somebody? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's all. It's part and parcel of who I am. Yeah. Yeah. So in your book, Mind is the Athlete, you say being consciously aware, and that's what we're talking about, being consciously aware is the starting point where the experience of fulfillment lives. Yeah. So when you've got attachment, you could say that the degree of your ta attachment shows a attachment to what is going on, to what you mm -hmm. like and what you don't like and how much you're trying to fix and change to get it the way you want it is, is inverse to your willingness yeah. to have, have life exactly the way it looks and exactly the way it doesn't in any moment. Yep. I've stopped playing around with the picture. Mm -hmm. I just leave it alone. Yeah. Don't try to organize it or fix it or move it around. Right. I want to make sure that people don't hear that, you know, I leave it alone like I'm going to kick my feet up on the chair and just kind of wait. Well, I don't ignore it. Right. But I don't try to fix it. Right. But I you allow may be, it to be feedback. Right. You may be in mad action. You might be getting a lot of stuff and do this and these things come up, but you're going through that because that's what's there in front of you to, to do. Yeah, it's, it's not like, like yeah. I can put dinner on the table, but I don't have my life depending on it. Right, right. I remember the story you told me once with um with Margaret Laird, and you had there was something going on with one of us kids, I can't remember, and you called her. And she's I don't know, you're gonna have to tell the story. I'm just trying to remind you about it, but it's when she when you said, Well, what should I do? And she said, Well, I don't know. You got dishes? Do the dishes. Right. What was the issue that came up? Because you were like, well, you know, you were like, oh, I got to do something. I, I don't remember, honey. Okay. Because it was when we were little and something was going on with one of us. Yeah. Probably one of you hurt yourself or something. And, and I called, called Margaret for yeah. help. Yep. And I thought I should do something about it. Right. And she pointed out very carefully to me, there wasn't anything I needed to do about it. I needed to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. I knew that it was there. Now, what is actually having that child exist? Pay attention to that principle rather than the picture that looks uncomfortable. And you and there would be and there could be actions that arise out of that that are absolutely perfect that you would take. For yeah, whatever. it isn't that you go read a book and forget the whole thing. Right. It's just that you just listen and you say, wait a minute. What's actually present is the reflective presence of the God idea. Mm -hmm. It's grounded in perfection. What has me believe it's not perfect? Right. The look at the past, because I can't see what's tomorrow. Right. And if I'm looking at the past, I'm not even looking at what's here right now. Yeah. But so when I can leave the past alone, and focus on whatever facts I know about being. You know, like intelligence, like love, like life, like truth, you know, like spirit. Right. All those things that I don't see, feel, hear, taste, touch. Right. But they're all present and they have me be. Yeah. Okay. So very good. All right. Now, Margaret Laird in Christian Science Reexplored said, a scientist in name and not in practice or understanding finds himself on the treadmill of life and death, sickness and health, right and wrong, which marks the non-scientist. <clears throat> so if you're not a scientist in practice, you're just not a scientist. Right. And, and what she's pointing to are the people who maybe considering themselves students, but they're just parroting words. Mm -hmm. They aren't really consciously aware of what they're saying. Mm -hmm. When you say all is infinite mind, you're saying all is the God idea. Right. Well, if all is the God idea, then where does that leave all the stuff I'm looking at and thinking has a problem. Right. It's not present. It's just a point of view. Yeah. 
And it's a point of view that I have in my belief that what I'm looking at exists. Mm -hmm. And so I begin to say, oh, well, it's just a point of view and it's in the past. What's present right now and right now and right now? Right. And I don't know what's present, so I'm on the edge of the unknown. And that's the curiosity kicking in, saying, so? So what now? Right. And that allows the whole new thing to show up. You know, we tend to think when a problem disappears that the, that the past feedback has been improved or fixed or changed or healed. Right. Not true. It's a whole new, right now, present, a whole new being showing up perfect. Yeah, oh. and, and in ways that you could never have conceived of. Right. In many ways. And oftentimes you see things that are obvious that you never saw before. That's right. Because you're not attached. It yep. clears your vision. Yep. Good. Good um, point. As well. So... Again, in Christian Science Re-Explored, uh, Margaret Laird says, truth has no power to remove error since error has no existence apart from truth. Yep. So say more about that. Well, in the human belief of things, when I say two and two is four, then I also go along and say, you see, two and two is not six. It's not seven. Two and two is not two. Two and two is four. So I'm looking at all the possibilities and settling on one do you know we play that game with our human living right i'm not quite sure that i get it so say it again because here it says well, truth has no power to remove error since error has no existence apart from truth so what's the error that would be getting removed the belief that there's something existing in what i see feel hear taste and touch and truth has no power to remove that Right, because it doesn't exist. How can it remove something that's the point of view? And it's a point of view that's different from your point of view. My point of view, of course, is right. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but when, it, you know, when you're looking at your belief about something, uh -huh. you got to realize nobody else sees it that way. Right. They may see shades of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to vote for the same guy you are. But is it a whole shade of difference between what you're doing and what somebody else is doing. Right. And it may look like it has similarities. It doesn't. There is no duplication anywhere in being. Okay. All right. So I think I, I think I get that one. And okay. if any of you have any questions, please type it into the comments and we will bring it into the conversation. Just know there's a little bit of a lag. Okay. So, Again, in Christian Science Re-Explored, Mrs. Laird wrote, correct material belief by spiritual understanding and spirit will form you anew. So as soon as you, you're clear that what you have is exactly perfect, exactly perfect then you're going to start to see things you never saw before and what arises from that is right from the unknown. Yeah, and, and the thing that we, I, I noticed with Mary Baker Eddy and with Margaret Laird and probably with some of my own writings, that we tend to think that we need to correct the, the look. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is, if you start in the middle of that sentence, you're much clearer. It's spiritual understanding that forms you anew. And when you're formed anew, the beliefs drop away. You didn't have to do a thing about them. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to correct the belief. Right. It disappeared. Right. Okay. All right. I get that. Okay, yeah. good. And then in Christian Science for Explored, Mrs. Laird also says, consciousness being infinite constructs a new body. It does not heal the old one. That's important. Read that again slowly. Consciousness. Being infinite constructs a new body. It does not heal the old one. So it's all things made new right now, right now, right now, right now, right, right now. There's no fixing or healing 
There's just right now, right Brand new, now. all the time. Yeah. yeah, that's infinity. Yep. Got it. It's the nature of being. Right. Yeah, very good. Okay. So moving on to Mary Baker Eddy on science and health. She said, you say that you have not slept well or have overeaten. You are a law unto yourself. And this is where I like to say, from your mouth to God's ear, about six inches. And it's probably not even that far. Right. But if you say it, it's your law. Yeah. To you. Right. Interesting. So think about all the things we say. About ourselves or about our friends or anything else. Just in a few hours, let alone a day. Yeah. And that little voice is not your friend, is what you find out. That, that noise inside your head that babbles all the time. Right. That's where you say thank you for sharing. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. I like that. That's cool. All right. And then again, in science and health, Mary Baker Eddy says you will suffer in proportion to your belief. Yep. And, the, and I would say in proportion to your belief or how strong your belief is, but how much you're attached to that belief. And that's the proportionate. Yeah. So <laughs> suffering is there. And yeah. And if you have attachment, it's harder to let go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But well, what you've the got, other thing you, you what, know, you've got with your, what you've got with your attachment is suffering. Just know that it's not it's not empty. It's not like you get nothing with attachment. No, you get to suffer with attachment. And prolong it. <laughs> and prolong and hold everything in place and prolong how you know well, the, see, the thing that we forget, and it's really easy to forget. But the thing that human beings forget is that they are the authority in their life. Yes. What you say is so, is so for you. Right. It may not be a universal law, but it, you will live that. Right. Until you get clear on something. Right. Very good. Okay. And in Science and Health, Mary Baker Eddy says, evidence drawn from the five physical senses relates solely to human reason. Truth is revolution. Is a revelation. A revelation is a revelation. Yeah. Or it could be a revolution too for some people. Um, but anyways. That's I, too like it. Right. But I really want to say, I want to look at this evidence drawn from the five physical senses relates solely to human reason. Yep. So anything you can see here, feel, taste, touch in your circumstances, all of that has nothing to do with truth or does it? Well, it's, it's, your your best view. View. it's your best view of the one reality present. Yeah. What, what you're looking at, you see, is grounded in perfection. Mm -hmm. Anything you see, feel, hear, taste, or touch, every concept, in other words, has reality present. Yeah. And right. this is the way you see it. Yeah. So if you can just if you can distinguish the characteristics of reality, you're way ahead mm -hmm. of anything that attachment would do for you. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Moving right along. If you could put yourself higher up in your frame, mom, like lower the, the you know, high, yeah, there you go. Sit so, up. yeah, sit up. Sit up. That's right, because you're like down here. All right. So moving right along on science and health. So long as mortals declare that certain states of the atmosphere produce something, fever, Qatar. Qatar fever, rheumatism, or consumption, those effects will follow. Not because of the climate, but on account of belief. Yeah. So belief is very powerful. Well, as you're saying, right? That's you're pulling the shots. You are yeah. the authority. Right. If you say so, you know, Mrs. Laird used to say that to me. Well, if you say so, Betty, have fun. Right. So your belief is super powerful. The fact is, though, is it gets in the way of life unfolding because you get stuck. Is that is that accurate or no? If you're saying anything based on the actuality of the seen, heard, and felt human belief system. 
it's always maybe so, maybe not, and mostly maybe not. But if you have the facts, like I can't see, um, except if I'm counting apples or something like that, but I can't see two and two is four. You know, those are integers and mentally I can figure that out. But if you can see that man is the expression of divine perfection, whole, complete, satisfied, joyous, free. If you get any sense of that, it will free you up from all of this belief you've got that that thing you see in the mirror has any importance. So if the thing in the mirror calls the shots based on what it sees in the mirror, you're in trouble. But if you get a picture for yourself of the being that has you occur, then you can look at the picture and say, maybe so, maybe not. Very good. Yeah. Cool. And there's some freedom. Yeah. Very nice. All right. Well, that's the end of our episode for tonight. So we will be back here um, next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Pacific. And we look forward to seeing you there. Again, leave any comments that you have and we will um, we can react to those. And we look forward to seeing you next week. And until then, for those of you in the U.S., have a really great July 4th holiday. Yes, happy 4th of July. And for those of you in Canada, there's another holiday. And now I can't remember what it is. But I know there's one in Canada, too. So <laughs> have that really great holiday as well. And we will see the rest of everybody. We'll see you all next week. Same bat channel, same bat time. All right. Adios over and out.